Good morning and Merry Christmas to all of you. We're glad that you guys are here at Hope City. Uh, My name is Peter. If I haven't met you, I'd love to do that afterwards. Right outside in the patio, uh, we can share a cup of coffee or something. Love to to get to know you a little bit more. But I'm thrilled that you're here at Hope City today. We have um, a great service planned for you today. We've got even, I think, even better planned for tomorrow. So if you're here and you're like, "Ah, I don't know if I'm going to come back tomorrow, do it. Do yourself a favor. Show up tomorrow as well, four and six, as you've heard. But, um, you know, I don't know what your house is like right now, even like in this moment, but um, as we've gotten closer and closer to Christmas, my kids have gotten more and more excited about opening presents. This is uh, my family. is my wife, Tiffany, and my son, Noah, my daughter, Grace, and our youngest, Leah, right there. Um, this was a, an incredible, uh, incredible season for us. But it's been like amping up with more and more excitement, more thrill of hope, if you will, as they're like, what's, gonna, what's coming under the tree? And... Uh, all that kind of stuff. And some of you are on the edge of your seat right now because you can't wait to open your presents. Like you're like, ah, this is going to be the greatest. Some of you can't wait to give that special present that you've got for somebody this week. Um, But all of this reminds me of a a mob family, another family. Um, There's a mob family. I used to live up in New Jersey, by the way. So this is how I know these things. There was a mobster who had a, a little boy, right? So he had this little boy. And at Christmas time, he sat down on his desk to write out his Christmas list to Jesus. And so this little boy sits down, he writes, um, you know, dear baby Jesus, I have been an extremely good boy all year. So I want a new, and he thought for a second, no, you know, that's not entirely true. So he crumples it up, kind of throws it in the corner and he writes the next one. He says, dear baby Jesus, I've been a pretty good boy this year. And uh, you know, that's not true either. And so he crumples that up, throws that to the side, and, and he's like, man, I, don't, I just don't know what I could possibly write. And then he goes, I got it. I, I got it all figured out. And he gets up off the desk, and he walks out to the family room, and he, and he grabs the, the statue of Virgin, you know, the Virgin Mary from the, from the family room and brings it back into his room, brings it to his closet, locks the door, and he goes, I got it all now. I got to figure it out. And he writes, dear God, if you ever want to see your mom again, Oh, hey, bada bing, oh, all the Italians in the room are getting a little uncomfortable. It's okay, all right, relax. Listen, none of us are angels, okay? None of us in this room are angels. Nobody's perfect. We're all, you know, we got the little elf on the shelf to keep us in check. But angels do, like, play a significant role in the Christmas story in the Bible. It's, it's incredible. Angels were used by God as messengers from heaven about what was happening, the birth of baby Jesus to his mother, Mary. And today... I want to read the original Christmas story to all of you from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, which is found on page 698 in the Bibles around you. You can turn in them, click over in your YouVersion app on your smartphone, or just kind of pay attention to the side screens. And I've got three lessons that I want us to learn from angels, from their message to Mary, that I think will encourage your heart today. That wherever you are in life right now, that I think that whether you're like you call yourself a Christian, whether you come to church a lot or whatever, I think that this morning there is something here for every single one of us, um, no matter what. So listen, listen with me in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. It was a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. He was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Man, this sounds like an incredible greeting, right? Like, who wouldn't love this, right? Who wouldn't be flattered by this? But in fact, Mary wasn't flattered. She was frightened. See, according to verse 29, she was just totally panicking. Look at this. She says, Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered, what kind of greeting might this be, right? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. Now, why would Mary be in like a full-on panic right now, right? You've got to know something about biblical angels, okay? In today's world, when people hear the term angel, you know, I think they think of something a little bit like this. They're like, oh, that's cool, right? Cutesy, a little precious moment, little angel. You may have one sitting at your home right now, kind of playing a a harp on a cloud or skipping with kittens, right? That's on Facebook. Um, But this is not how angels were depicted in Scripture. It looked maybe a little bit more like this. See, in in Scripture, angels were mighty. They were fierce warriors, and they clearly had abs that went all the way up to their neck. And it was just incredible, right? And but they were fierce enough to like destroy a whole town, but sensitive enough to care for and, and protect an individual baby's life. 
So let's set the record straight, okay? Let's just be totally clear here this morning. Angels are not people who have died and gone to heaven and sprouted wings, okay? Rather, these are spiritual beings that God created in the beginning of time who live in God's presence and do God's will. Angels protect the, the, you know, the helpless, and they deliver God's messages. And yet, Mary was greatly troubled at this, right? Like, you know, angels coming to speak to me? What? What do you want with me? The angel Gabriel puts her at ease in verse 30. Look at this. He says, do not be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid. Relax, okay? You have found favor with God. See, remember that Mary was, you know, pledged to be married. She was actually engaged to be married to, uh, in marriage to a man named Joseph. And she was probably all amped up for her wedding, right? Like she knew what was coming. She'd be doing what every other woman here in the room would do, and that'd be scrolling through Pinterest, creating your, your perfect wedding board, right? Like Mary's doing it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do this. Oh, shoes with the thing? Oh, great. And that's, I don't even know what that is. It just looks like a thing to me. Uh, you ladies are like, it's called a something. But uh, so she'd be doing all that stuff, trying to find the creative ideas. She's got her Instagram handle on lockdown, right? Like at Mrs. underscore Mary underscore Joseph. Like she's ready to go. It's going to be the the perfect wedding of her life. And then what happens? What happens is this angel interrupts her plans. He interrupts everything, leaving her trying to catch her breath and figure life out. 2,000 years ago, a girl by the name of Mary was touched by an angel. And 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. We're still learning things. In fact, we've got three things for us to learn this morning. And the first thing, if you're taking notes with us today, is that God's interruptions are often inconvenient. So as you think through your own life and as you've laid it out and you're like, oh man, this isn't, my life hasn't been perfect, hasn't been, been perfect, and well, then get in line. You're just like the rest of us, okay? God's interruptions are often can, inconvenient, aren't they? They come at moments when you least expect it or when you don't welcoming it, when you don't welcome it. Why? Because it messes up your plans. One year ago yesterday, Tiffany and I were getting ready for Hope City's first ever Christmas Eve service. And Christmas Eve here at Hope City is it's just a fantastic time to be together. It's a memorable night. And so we were, you know, running around doing last minute errands and, and prepping things. And all of this stuff was going through our heads. And, and we had a, a really, really good friends of ours who said, hey, why don't you just send the kids over to our house? They can come play over here and we'll take care of it. You guys can do your thing. And so we were like, okay, that's great. Thank you. That's awesome. Midway through the morning, we get this phone call, this like frantic phone call. And I pick up the phone, and, and on the other end of the line, all I hear is, you need to get over here now and pick up Leah. And so first I'm like, okay. And then one second later, I hear this, this sobbing wail, like this just like guttural pain. And, and I can tell that, you know, when dads, you know when it's your kid and you're like, you're locked in on it. Well, I was locked in, baby. I was like, I turned into a transformer. It was like, get out of the way, like everything, threw everything to the side and hustled over to this house. And I walk in and I find my little girl kind of curled up on a lap uh, and somebody consoling her. And she's got this nail sticking in the bottom of her foot, like right, not in like the tough part or up here, but like right in that really sensitive spot that when you step on a Lego, you want to like, you know, just <clears throat> get unholy and lose Jesus for about five minutes. You know what I'm talking about? That spot. This little girl had this nail in her foot, and everything had to stop. Like, my life had to hit pause. And I wouldn't have it any other way. We drove off to urgent care, and um, I spared you the detail of the one in the foot. I've got a couple of those, too. You can text me about those later. But um, the doctors are taking four ever to get this nail out. I mean, I'm, I'm saying forever and ever. And I'm like, pull it out. Well, we don't know. Maybe it's in the bone. I, yeah, get it out. It's coming out eventually, right? Like, just pull it out. They took an eternity. I had to phone a friend. Like, I had to be like, hey, do you have any pull with this place? Like, get it out. Pull it out, right? And so, all of a sudden, I find myself in this tension of like, I want to care for my daughter, 
but Christmas Eve is coming. Like, I've got stuff that I need to do. Like, have you ever felt that way where you're in attention of something is interrupting another thing that, and, and it just feels like, man, God's interruptions are often, they often work that way. They're inconvenient. It feels just like I felt one year ago yesterday. See, oftentimes when God's interruptions become or feel inconvenient, we, it's only inconvenient because we have a different plan or a different schedule for how things are supposed to happen in our life or our family. See, don't forget, don't forget who Mary was, right? What did, what did the angel say to Mary? She said, hey, Mary, you are highly favored by God. See, no, no angel ever said, hey, Mary, God doesn't like you, so... Um, Here's, here's what's going to happen, okay? No, he said, you are highly favored by God. And all of us, what? All of us want the favor of God, right? Like, who doesn't want the favor of God? Sign me up for that, right? Like, we all want the blessings of God. Many Christians, we love the idea that, that God may, um, may give us our wildest dreams come true, right? And like health and wealth and happiness and all this stuff. But it doesn't work like that, okay? Like, I hate to break it to you. That isn't God's intention and plan for everybody because sometimes what if we don't like the idea that God may allow something to happen to you that you weren't expecting? Or God may ask you to do something that could wreck the the picture-perfect family or picture-perfect marriage or life that you had planned. In other words, we all want to be close enough to God to get the good stuff, right? But then when I promise, you know, we want the promises of heaven and we want his blessings, but... I don't want to be so close to God, so surrendered to God or to do, be obedient to God that, uh, you know, it'll, he'll have total access to every area of my life and I might end up like, what, moving to like Africa to be a missionary or something, right? Like, not into that. What happens if we become so surrendered that God might actually make us change our lifestyle, right? We're, we're afraid of that. Or maybe he might make us open up our home to, 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 to foster kids. Or maybe he's going to ask you to give up something that you love, like food or alcohol. Or maybe he's going to ask you to marry someone who doesn't look like your ideal, right? Like, in your head, I was going to marry Zac Efron, right? That's what she said. But I got Zac Galifianakis, okay? Like, <laughs> what? I read that in Tiffany's journal the other day, and I'm like, huh? Where'd that come from? I don't see any resemblance. Uh, I see. I don't know though. Like, if what thoughts you've had like that? I don't know. I'm see. I'm talking real life here today. If you're new to Hope City, we love to just be real. I'm a I'm a real person, and this church is filled with real people. So you just sit there and polish your halo, and we'll all be good. The rest of us are going to talk about real life. See, sometimes, sometimes we feel fear. Sometimes in life. We feel fear because we're, we're afraid of the what if. Like, what if I give God control of my life? Like, what if I actually do what that crazy preacher is saying and I, that I should do? What if I do what the Bible tells me I should do as I read it? And it doesn't go the way that I planned. See, fear can cripple our thoughts. Some people would say that, that fear, that if you have fear, you're afraid that you just don't have faith. Have you ever heard that? It's not true. I would, I would argue with that. I would say that you don't have faith. You just have faith in the wrong thing. That you've placed your faith, that belief that something will happen in the wrong thing. See, fear isn't the absence of faith. It's just faith misplaced. See, your faith, fear is putting faith in the what ifs. Fear is, is faith in the what if I lose my job? What if, I, if someone I love gets cancer? What if I never get married? What if, what if, what if? And you just keep playing all of those what ifs out in your world. That's, that's where fear originates. Pastor Craig Rochelle says this so well. He says, fear is placing faith in the worst case scenario. When you think about what could potentially happen and your mind gets to that one spot that is the worst case, that's where what fear is. It's putting our faith in that. In fact, I think the best definition for fear, and you can write this down, is fear is false evidence appearing real. It's that false evidence in your life appearing real. This is what fear is. But the good news is, for you and I, we don't need to stay in fear. The good news is that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that, that Paul writes to Timothy and he says this, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but God has actually given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. 
right? Like that's what God tells us. So why do we get afraid for God's plans in our life when he says, no, 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 I'm going to give you power, love, and a sound mind? See, number one, it's God's interruptions are often inconvenient. But the second thing is that if you're taking notes, that what we call interruptions, God calls invitations, What you and I can see as an interruption, like Mary, right? Mary had these wedding plans, and she says, I'm inviting. God says, wait, 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 I've got an invitation. I want to invite you into a bigger and a better story than you ever could have imagined. Like, I'm inviting you, Mary, into my global story of bringing salvation to the entire world. And do you know what? Like, we see this pattern of divine invitation all throughout Scripture, See, what did God do with Moses, right? Remember Moses from the Old Testament? The, you know, kind of, uh, you know, he's got these two tablets, the Ten Commandments, right? We all remember Moses from that. And Moses was invited, he was invited into what? A, a huge story. He's tending sheep in kind of the, the back 40 of the wilderness, right? And all of a sudden, this bush catches on fire, and he's like, I got to go see that thing. And it's not burning up. And God speaks to him and says, hey, I want you to, to become the deliverer of my people, or what about Saul? Saul, you may, you may remember Saul. He is the, God interrupted his life of, of killing Christians and being the most religious person in the world. And God interrupts that and says, no, 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 it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And I'm going to flip that on its head for what you actually think relationship with God is like. And Saul was invited into becoming the Apostle Paul, who went around the Mediterranean Rim and planted churches all over the place, and guess what? Wrote half of the New Testament that you and I hold in our hands even today. See, for thousands of years, God has been interrupting plans, and he's been inviting us into something even bigger and better. And I believe that there's, there's people in this room today who try and shake off God's invitations because we just call them interruptions. When God is actually really trying to do something new and different in our lives, and I, don't, I honestly don't know how this would play out for you, but if you're sensitive enough to see what we call human interruptions as a possible divine invitation, God might just take you somewhere you had no idea, somewhere different, to something even more special than you could have ever imagined or arranged on your own. See, some of you today, you weren't church people this time last year. Like last year, if I had said, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll be a part of Hope City. You're going to love it. You're gonna, there's going to be people that love you. Uh, you'd be like, yeah, right. Right? Like there's not a chance. But what happened? Someone interrupted your life. Someone said, hey, um, you know, you should, uh, you should come check out my church. Like you should come do this thing, right? Like we do it on Sundays every week and come check it out. Totally normal. And you're like, nah, no thanks, not interested, right? Like, I don't have time or whatever your reason was. But finally, you said, okay, I'll come, right? Because that's what Hope City people do is they just don't give up. They don't take no for an answer. They just keep inviting and inviting and inviting, and you don't go away. And so you thought, okay, I'm going to come to church. You came one time, and I don't know, maybe like you're like, I'll just endure it and get in, get out, get it over with. And something happened. Something happened in your life, and you were touched by a song, or, or you were touched by a message that seemed like God was speaking only to you, directly to you, and your heart was starting to, to soften, and you found yourself being drawn to God. See, sometimes invitations come, and they look a little bit like, like, like uh, these interruptions, but God is inviting us into something even bigger and better than what we ever could have planned for ourselves. In Luke chapter 1, the angel of the Lord appears to Mary, to this girl who has the next 10 years of her life planned out, right? She says, and he says, I've got something better for you. It may be scary at first, but let me remind you what the angel said one more time. He says, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. But notice that God's favor isn't exactly what Mary thought it would be. She's thinking, oh, God's favor, man, send me off to Hawaii, right? Like Joseph and I on a honeymoon to Hawaii, that's perfect. Sign me up. That's ideal, but that's not it. That's not the favor of the Lord. See, if you're taking notes, the third thing that I want us to think about today is that God's purpose is greater than your plans. Your very best plan that you could ever come up with, God has a a better plan than that. God's plan is way better than that. In fact, his purpose is, is used often for us is so much richer than what we planned out for ourselves. 
And God's like, man, I want you to be a part of this. I want to invite you to this. See, in verses 31 through 33, the angel Gabriel gets so specific. He says, you're going to conceive, you're going to give birth to a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Translation, Mary, you're going to give birth to a king. And his name's going to be Jesus. His father's going to be God, and he'll be the savior of the world. Now, you can only imagine this teenage girl, right? Like, she's like, what? How's this going to happen? And her emotions are swinging like crazy because she's a teenager after all, and they're crazy. But then we also know that, like, she just heard for the first time that she's going to have a baby, and the baby's going to be a king. That's amazing. I'm going to give birth. It's going to be a king. But I'm going to give birth. What? I got to tell Joseph. What is everybody going to say? What are people going to do? What about my reputation? Wait, how does this even happen? Like, I know how that happens, but it hasn't happened. Huh? You're doing what? Right? Like, all of these things kind of begin to, you know, like, overwhelm her mind. And, and so on one hand, she's got faith, like, yes, okay, I've been chosen. On the other, she's got fear. Like, what could happen? Fear is that false evidence that appears real. And the Bible says that God has a plan to bless you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. And every now and then, he's going to intentionally allow what you might call an interruption. But from his perspective, it's an, an invitation to something even bigger and better than what your mind could have imagined. And the angel appears to Mary, announces God's glory and her, the eternal purpose for her life. And he says, she says this, how will this be? Mary asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Like, I don't want to get too specific here, angel, but like, how will this be? For Mary, pregnancy seemed impossible. How could it be? See, that's our natural reaction in times when anytime God tells us to do something that's hard or difficult or challenging, it, it may seem impossible. See, for me, this would be like an angel showing up today and being like, hey, Peter, by the way, next year you're going to win the New York City Marathon. And I'd be like, hmm, I'm not a runner, bro. Like, this dude runs on Duncan. Starbucks, to be really clear, but whatever. Like, we're not going to be that nitpicky. But that's what Mary's saying. She's like, mm -mm, I'm a virgin. How will this be? How will it be? See, it's like angels appearing to football fans, being like, hey, guys, the Bucks are going to win the Super Bowl this year. And you're all like, how will this be? Mm, too soon? Oh, sorry. Um, but let me be more real life, right? Like a little bit more down to earth. If you're single and hoping to be married at this point, it may seem really impossible. You know, you're getting older, you've wanted to start a family, but now you're in your 40s and 50s and, you're, and time's ticking. And you're thinking, well, how will, how will this be? Like, seriously, just doesn't make sense. Or there'll be a time, I promise, for every follower of Jesus that God is going to, to look at you or he's going to say something and he's going to ask you to do something and say, um, I want you to have the faith to believe. And you may look at it and say, I don't see how that's possible. How will it be? How will that be possible? God, I don't know how you, I know you want me to be generous. I know like you want me to be generous at the end of the year and, and to give you this Christmas offering or hope for all offering, and I'm, but I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I, how will that be, God? Like, or God, I believe that you could heal the person I love the most, but the doctor said that it's medically impossible to prepare for the worst, but I believe, how will this be? See, that's what Mary says. And you know what? She's right, because humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, that's where faith and God and, and fear just disappears because verse 35 says, the angel answered Mary and he said this, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In other words, Mary, this doesn't depend on you. Mary, it does not depend on your abilities. This will require the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill this and then Gabriel said these words, and I want to actually invite you to kind of participate with me. Um, this is from the, the King James Version, and he says, For with God, what? Nothing. Say that out loud. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. 
Nothing is impossible with God. Did you guys hear that? Like this is the Christmas promise to all of you, that nothing is impossible with God. See, I don't know, somebody is here in church for this moment right now, that nothing is impossible with God in your life. There is nothing in your life that God can't turn around, can't change, can't heal, can't mend, can't redeem, can't bring life back to. Nothing. In fact, that is the only impossible thing, is that God can't do it. See, God is, is just that big, and God's personal promise to you, maybe this Christmas your family is, is facing some an impossibility, and, and you, need to, you, know, you need to know that what seems impossible to you is completely possible to God. Or you need to know that we serve an all-powerful God who can step in and in, and in a word he can intervene and change your whole life. God may be asking you to do something that's unbelievable or to do something that's beyond your abilities, your capabilities. And the truth is you couldn't do it on your own because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I want to ask you a very simple question today. What is God asking you to do or believe this Christmas? Just that. That's all I'm asking. What is God asking you to do or to believe this Christmas? Because if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower... You have his Holy Spirit inside of you. And when the Holy Spirit's inside of you, he loves to give birth to new things to, that bring glory to Jesus, okay? So for some of you, the answer might be immediate. You already know, but you've been spending this last year resisting it, right? Like you're like, you know, I know what that is. I know what you want me to do, God, but I've been pushing that off all year long. Like, God, what do you have next for me? Some of you might be like, okay, so what's, what do I need to do in 2019? And for some of you, that's going to be very easy. It's going to come to you like this. I'm going to volunteer with, with Hope City Youth. I, I'm going to invest in the next generation. Or maybe um, God is actually pressing on your heart, and he's kind of encouraging you and giving, inviting you to, to foster a child over this next year or to support a foster family. It's one of our big initiatives in, in 2019 is to help support and undergird uh, foster families here in Sarasota County. Maybe he's asking you to serve our church on the dream team with the roadies and help set up and, and tear down and, and create environments for people to get meaningfully connected with God and with one another. But what is God asking you to do or to believe this Christmas that seems beyond your ability? But don't forget, with God, nothing is impossible. With nothing. You have to realize, though, that this one thing, though, that the, your responsibility is obedience. Outcome is God's. So you're like, I don't know how that's going to happen. That's not the problem. That's not your problem. Your problem is, will I be obedient? The question is, will I be obedient? And the outcome is God's. See, for the last few weeks, our church family, we've been praying about our, our Hope for All offering our year-end Christmas campaign. And, and you've seen um, this brochure. It's in your programs today. And, and it explains the three different things that we're doing. We're increasing uh, our, the way that we serve families here at Hope City. We want to see more leaders care for people better. And we want to reach beyond our walls and, and do some incredible things in our community for our community. But we've been praying about that. We've set a goal of $35,000, like above and beyond what we're already doing. And it's like, okay, we want to, you know, seed new churches, like help seed new churches start up in 2019. And last week I got a letter in the mail that stopped me in my tracks. It made me, it made me just kind of close my eyes and, and pray and thank God. And, and I, it's a short letter. I just want to read this to you guys. It says, Happy Saturday. There's a lot of things uncertain in our lives, but one thing we know is our calling to support you both and Hope City Church. We believe in the vision and the calling on your lives for Sarasota. We love your kids and even Cooper a little bit. That's our dog, by the way. And, and once again, we both felt the need to give. And at this time in this situation, it's obvious that obedience is essential for us. Anything can happen. Anything is possible. And I'm so excited to hear about exceeding the 35,000, dated December 8th. Like, I felt like God, I felt God saying to me, haven't I provided in the past? Yeah. Do you believe that my heart is behind the next generation? Yeah. Do you believe that my heart is for the foster kid? You better believe it. 
then why are you afraid, right? That's what I felt like God was saying to me. Why are you afraid? And I'm like, well, what if we don't hit our goal by December 31st? What if? And then the what if started playing in my head. Like, well, what if? We've already committed to the, to the twig. We're going to do this, the, the boxes of hope to care for foster families. What if we can't? What if? What if? And what if started popping up? And then all of a sudden I remember, what is fear? Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is that what if, believing the, the what if, putting faith in the what if, putting stock in that. And my my heart in this moment was flooded with peace as I read that letter. Because why? I want to be a part of a church at the end of the year that walks by faith, not by fear. I want to be a part of a church that does that every day of the year. And I don't know how this is going to play out for you. But there's going to come a moment when God is asking you to trust him, to take steps of faith towards him. And just like the angel asked Mary, God's asking you this this Christmas, will you be obedient? Will you surrender your whole life to him just like an innocent teenage girl did 2,000 years ago? I love Mary's response to the angel. In, In verse 38, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. There's another translation that that writes it this way, that pens it this way. It says, God, may all your dreams from my life come true. Imagine if that's what you said. You just woke up every day and you said, God, may all your dreams from my life come true. Isn't that beautiful? She says, I'm the Lord's servant. And even though I don't understand the details, even though I don't know how this is going to happen, I can trust him with the outcome because I know that God is good and that God is loving and and completely trustworthy. And if he interrupts me with something inconvenient, then I want to surrender myself to him because his ways are higher than my ways. His purposes are higher than my plans. So God, may all of your dreams for my life come true because ultimately, obedience is my responsibility. But the outcome is God's. So what is God inviting you to be obedient in or to believe or do this year?